It's just four years now since Saliha Osmanovic buried her son here. This is the first time she's been able to return to Srebrenica, where he was killed. July 11, 1995, five days after Saliha Osmanovic's son was killed, the Muslim town of Srebrenica in eastern Bosnia fell to the Bosnian Serb army. The world's first United Nations safe area became the site of the worst massacre in Europe since World War II. Mrs. Osmanovic's husband, Ramo, and second son, Nermin, attempted to escape. Ramo was captured by Serb soldiers and for a moment by a Serb cameraman. <laughs> This is the last glimpse of Ramo Osmanovic. Saliha Osmanovic's husband and son disappeared, becoming part of a terrible statistic, the 7,414 missing men of Srebrenica. I vidla sam ga ja, on zove ovaj zove Nermina. Ovako stavio ruke i zove Nermina. I zove ga Hajdolan ba Ekrani, ekrani, brzina je tu, znaš, ali fino ja vidim mu muža, vidim odjeću šta je na njemu i vidim da je on. Svi ajte! O, Nermine! In the old salt mines under the Muslim town of Tuzla, they still store more than a thousand nameless bodies from Srebrenica. Coming to this awful place, it's impossible to escape the reality that this happened in Europe at the end of the 20th century. Today, like thousands of other women of Srebrenica, 
Saliha Osmanovic still waits for news of her husband and son. Now, on the fourth anniversary of the massacre, Saliha is making a painful journey. Along with hundreds of other widows and survivors of Srebrenica, she's going back for the first time into Serbian territory and to the place where it all began. This was the base for 450 Dutch UN peacekeepers just outside Srebrenica. The Dutch soldiers were responsible for watching over the first United Nations safe area. But between the 11th and the 14th of July, 1995, faced with 25,000 desperate refugees, the UN peacekeepers and the international community stood by as men were separated from women by the Bosnian Serb army. Within a few days, thousands of men were massacred in nearby fields, schools and warehouses. Four years later, the women of Srebrenica are still looking for the bodies of their men and for answers from the world which looked on and did nothing. Hasan Nohanovic lost his entire family here. My mother, I know that she's dead. But I want to know what happened to my brother, what happened to my father. Then, when I know that, I want to know where their bodies are, to bury them properly, to be identified, if possible, of course. And also, I want to know who killed them, and I want all these murderers to be arrested and punished. Otherwise, I will never find peace in my life. Oh, I, th I think there's no doubt that, that something went wrong, horribly wrong. Uh, Srebrenica remains uh, the worst massacre in Europe uh, since World War II. Uh, it's also taken on a significance of its own, I think. It's crying out for an explanation, not just of what the Serbs did uh, in Srebrenica and to the people of Srebrenica, uh, but also uh, what the international community did or didn't do and what it could have done. The enormity of what happened at Srebrenica in July 1995 overwhelms understanding. Eight, six, six, 
now a bewildered world looks to the methodical processes of international justice to deal with the brutal mess of genocide. Jean-René Ruez is a former French policeman from Marseille. Now he's the chief investigator into the Srebrenica massacre for the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. For four years, he's been working to uncover the awful truth of what happened in July 1995. What we are talking about is a crime against humanity, and a crime against humanity is a crime committed against every uh, single one of us. So indeed, um, there is a lot of effort put in it by everyone who participates in such an investigation to make sure that uh, the situation is dealt with properly in the interest of the victims, but also in the interest of everyone to make sure that all these uh, atrocities are indeed uh, properly recorded and uh, frozen into history. Since 1995, Srebrenica has been ethnically cleaned and is an entirely Serb town. We kept coming back, trying to understand what happened here. The memory of the massacre has been erased, along with thousands of people who were once here. Srebrenica, grad čiji početi dosežu do rimskih vremena. Nekdašnja domavija danas je lijepo banjsko klimatsko lječilište. For the 9,000 people who lived in Srebrenica before the war began in 1992, life was comfortable. Three quarters of the population were Muslim, the rest Serb. But under the long communist rule of Marshal Tito, most people had paid little attention to their neighbor's religion. Nearby factories and mines paid good wages, and the spa brought tourists to this remote area of eastern Bosnia. Čist vazduh i povoljni klimatski uslovi čine ovaj kraj prirodno predodređenim za razvoj stacionarnog zimskog i ljetnjeg planinskog turizma. Zumra Shekomerovic lived with her Muslim family in a house near the town center for 27 years. Prije rata sam živjela u svojoj porodičnoj kući sa svojim mužem i sa svoje dvoje djece. Živilo se fino jer smo radili, zarađivali za život. Imali nekakav normalan život. Da smo mogli da imamo i auto i da odimo na godišnji odmor i da odimo na izlet Ovo sam ja sa mojim mužem davne 1970. godine. Ovo je moj muž sa svojim sinom u Makarskoj namoru 1978. godine. Ovo je slika na zabavi na dočeku 1972. godine u Hotel Domavi. Tad sam dobila nagradu za najljepšu frizuru. Sve to tako bilo i početkom 1992. godine. Mene je rat zatekao u Srebrenici sa svojim mužem. The war came early to eastern Bosnia and to Srebrenica. Only 10 miles from the border with Serbia, the town was a coveted target 
for Serb nationalists dreaming of creating a greater Serbia. Over the next three years, the town was to become a hostage in the savage ethnic war which was consuming Bosnia and was in the end to consume the people of Srebrenica. The story of Srebrenica may seem to be a freakish throwback to medieval savagery. But it's essentially a story of our times. A catastrophe witnessed by camcorder. A British reporter finds his way through the surrounding Serb forces to reach Srebrenica. His camera records the desperate situation of 60,000 Muslim refugees trapped in the town. There was no food, there was no, I mean, there was, nothing worked at all. There, there were no shops, there, were no, there was no electricity, there was no water, so slowly uh, we realized that we were going to have big problems uh, with food, especially. And uh, by the end of 92, in the beginning of 93, people almost, you know, they starved to death. And, uh, and uh, we, my family was in, in terrible uh, situation. I had one person who was in the house, 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 in the Nikako, ali et bilo mu opet dobro, sad to što. Haj preživćeš, haj vraćeš se kući, nika. Serb kameras record the menacing power of the forces besieging the town for three years from the surrounding mountains. There were these bombardments all the day, and even bombardments was, were not so terrible as, as the fact that Serb troops and Chetniks, as we call them, were so near the place that you could expect any time of day or night that they, you know, break through the defense lines and come and kill you, you know, with, with a knife. That, that's what we were afraid of. A Muslim warlord and defender of Srebrenica, Nasa Oric, stokes his legend as a scourge of the Serbs with heroic images from his camcorder. Legendary commandant, Nasa Oric. Morali smo, nismo imali izbora. Bili smo u jednom velikom okruženju i onaj, mi nismo imali izbora da, ovaj, ništa drugo ono da se branimo. Morali smo se braniti svim mogućim raspoloženim sredstvima. Znači, i poštujući i nepoštujući ženijsku konvenciju. I, i, I srpska strana i muslimanska. Znači, samo što su oni bili u položaju, u boljem položaju no mi. Oni su imali i tehniku, imali su i, i logistiku, imali su i sve živo su imali. Dok mi smo morali, imali smo samo goli život, a ono sve ostalo morali smo da se snađemo. Znači, to je. As the Muslim refugees in Srebrenica grow more desperate, raids by Nasa Oric on surrounding villages, followed by ravenous bands of scavengers, become more frequent and more bloody. Na Boži 7. januara 1993. godine oni su napali područje Kravice, gdje su ljudima e, u tom napadu počinili mnogo zla. E, po, Pobili su sve one ljude do kojih su došli, a došli su naravno pretredno do staraca, do žena i tako dalje. Svjočanstva su groblja, velika groblja oko Srebrenci, po selima.
ali bio je veliki pritisak srpskog naroda na ovom području i naravno u Republike Srpskoj da srpska vojska odgovori na te napade, da preduzme ofanzivne mjere, da oslobodi. A camera is there to record the dramatic arrival in Srebrenica of UN commander General Philippe Morion and his promise of rescue. I kad je rekao da je zaštićena zona, da nama neće ništa faliti, da se budimo u bezbednosti, da skromno spavam. Pa jesam bila u Srebrenici, gledala ja Mariona. Jesam ja bila u Srebrenici. I moja djeca i moj čovjek, svi mi bili smo mi u Srebrenici. Da je zaštićena zona, da nam neće ništa smetati. Da mi bili. In creating the safe area in April 1993, the UN Security Council in New York is responding to the disturbing images coming from the camcorders in the besieged town. These people in New York reacted to appalling stories of tragedy unfolding before their eyes on television and they you know, naturally felt they had to do something. And they produced high-sounding resolutions, which we on the ground did not have the ability to execute. When Dutch UN peacekeepers arrive in January 1995 to watch over the safe area, Warrant Officer Wim Dijkma's camera records their daily life. He is also to record their part in the tragedy of Srebrenica. We as Dutch came from well, a quite rich country, uh, not used to war. If you are there, you realize that you don't know the feelings of people who had war for several years. Sometimes I had a feeling I understood the words they said, but I didn't understand the feelings. As they assemble in their base at Potichari, an old factory just three miles north of the town, the new Dutch battalion and their commander, Colonel Tom Karamans, face a mountain of problems. UN was there to keep peace, but not to enforce it. Uh, UN did not have enough equipment or uh, troop strength to enforce anything on any of the uh, warring parties. In the spring of 1995, the Serbs tighten their stranglehold, cutting off convoys to the safe area. Soon, the Dutch are starved of personnel, ammunition, fresh food and fuel. With most of their vehicles stranded, they're reduced to foot patrols. Hasan Nuhanovic gets a job as an interpreter for the beleaguered Dutch battalion. From my conversations with the Dutch soldiers, they were just saying, we want to go home, you know, we don't want to stay here, it's not our war, you know, I don't see any sense of staying here. In early July 1995, Wim Dijkma's camera records the refugees besieged in Srebrenica by the surrounding Bosnian Serb army. The final act in their tragedy is about to begin. On July 6th, Saliha Osmanovic's son, Edin, is killed by a Serb shell which lands near the school in Srebrenica. I Her personal anguish is a prologue to the nightmare which is to engulf Srebrenica over the next nine days.
I personally never expected General Mladic to overrun the enclave because the world was watching. It was uh, first a little bit foggy, and uh, after the fog uh, went uh, went away, we uh, the shelling started over again. After a while, we saw a Serb uh, tank uh, drive towards uh, the enclave. After that, uh, the Serb soldiers uh, came to the uh, observation post. Uh, so they, they entered the enclave. You, you can only guess what, what's going to happen to you. You don't know for sure. And after a while, uh, they get more aggressive. Uh, starting uh, searching for weapons, uh, all kinds of stuff. At that time, the, uh, the commander of uh, the Serbian, uh, or Bosnian Serbian troops uh, told our commander that he, he didn't control his men anymore and he asked us to leave. That was the, the uh, most important defensive position because up to that hill, you just walk down the slope to the town. So after that moment, People were very worried that the Serbs could just come down the hill uh, to the town. There was no way to, to stop them. And at that moment, they uh, threw a hand grenade in the uh, APC. The APC gunner was uh, wounded uh, on his head and uh, fell in the APC. So it was a panic situation doing everything we can uh, to uh, to save uh, our comrades life and uh, hoping the best of it we always thought the serbs would do that but in my mind never occurred that the muslims would kill one of us. So that was a, quite a shock for us and I know it's wrong and everybody knows it's wrong but you blame a big part of the population for it. Really an open attack at UN was telling the people that if the UN cannot defend its own observation post how can it defend the people? Muslim got a note and he wrote down 30 Dutch and 30,000 Muslims. He said, as long as the 30 Dutch are in the hands of the Bosnian Serbs, the UN won't risk anything because uh, your 30 soldiers are even more valuable than the 30,000 Muslims.
we still believed that they couldn't uh, capture the, the, the entire enclave. UN and, uh, and, and, and the world couldn't, couldn't just uh, let that happen. I uh, realized that something very bad was going to happen. I mean, that the, the place was going to fall the evening, the night before, before the, uh, the fall, which was 10 July. And I somehow managed to walk through the streets, up the hill to the house where my family was living for three and a half years. So we made a deal that I take my brother with me because I was kind of hope. I was some, somebody who could speak English, who could communicate with his foreigners who were so powerful, so my brother was safe with me. He told us, no stone will be on another stone in the southern part after tomorrow, after the airstrikes. So we all were convinced that there would be airstrikes in the southern part. There was some kind of uh, dead silence, evening of 10 July. Uh, shelling stopped, you know, there was no shooting, which was very, very strange. Well, at six o'clock, uh, the bombing uh, should have been started. And we all saw that it was uh, foggy and we knew it wouldn't start yet. So at seven o'clock, uh, some of us uh, went out again and looking and it was clear again then at that time. So we start waiting. We were all looking up at the sky. Thousands of people, you know, looking up at the sky, listening to the sound. There were no jets. We should have known better because the feeling that the whole world, the UN, Holland, everybody let us down, we had for months. I think from, from April that nobody would care about us and, more important, wouldn't care about the refugees. That morning, when it was 8, 9, 10 o'clock, our belief faded away and we all looked at each other and said, it's again they dropped us. This, this waiting was more terrible, terrible than the, 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 you know, shooting. So at 10.30 approximately, uh, first shell started to fall down again. There was a stream of people coming down, down the street, running, children, women, everybody, and the men were running to the woods, to the woods. That was the moment when everybody separated, in fact. 
not one single male believed that once he falls into the hands of the Serbs, he could be treated as a POW or, or whatever, you know. All boys and, and, and grown-up men thought that they, they, they have to escape from the Serbs. So that, that's why most of them decided to go up to the mountains. It was 36, 37 degrees Celsius. It was very, very hot at that time. A lot of elder people who were, who were trying to help each other towards Potichari, uh, babies, uh, sick people, trying to climb on the APC. Two mortar shells fell directly, you know, among the people. I, I felt the blast. On my face, it, you know, it lifted me a little bit from the ground. Uh, the Dutch were also panicking, they were running all around the place. I saw some people died immediately on the spot, they were torn apart. Izašli smo i nismo kuću zaključali. Uzeli smo ključ, a nismo je zaključali. Ja sam izašla u mojoj avli, ja sam u avli imala divno cvijeće. Veliko. I mogu da vam kažem da me sad bole avlije. Ne bole me kuće, ali me bole avlije. Bole me cvijeće. Ruže me bole, srce mi paraju. I thought the airstrikes, in fact, began. I, I, I only heard two very loud explosions, and there were no more explosions, and the Serb shelling even intensified after these explosions. So there was no uh, airstrike, there was no help from outside the enclave, and that was what we were counting for. And it was very, very tragic at that time, of course. All, all the men separating from, from the women, the, women, the men uh, went by foot, and all the women and children were coming with us to Potichari. It was very, very, very sad, of course. I saw the refugees coming in to the compound, the first groups, and we bring them into a, the big hall where the cars are, and we save them there. Then I saw my parents coming with some bags, carrying some, carrying some bags, <clears throat> and uh, they were they were smiling, they were they were happy, you know, they were, they were happy to see me. They were happy that my brother was safe. They thought definitely safe, you know. And they just said hello, very satisfied. They entered the base, and that's the moment when I told myself, no problem, I'm doing my job as an interpreter. My parents are in the base, my brother is in the base. The three and a half years of suffering in Srebrenica is over. Thank you. Huh? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Skine ovu tablu. Ulica Selma Nagić, Reuk, Crni. Skinite to. Hajde. Penji se, bre, čoveče, nemoj da ti govorim. Des puta i ponesi to. Hajde, žile, hajde, žile, hajde, žile, hajde, žile, krstiću. Hajde, krle. Momci, pravac, bratunac, ne ovam. Pre dvije godine, dan je strbi ugla, čestitam. Ovo je slobodno. A sad smo se našli. Evo, kvarante. E, gospodine, veziliče. Ljubo, 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 ljubo. Evo nas, 11. jula 1995. godine, u Srpskoj Srebrenici. U oči još jednog velikog praznika srpskoga, poklanjamo srpskom je narodu. Ovaj grad i napokon došao je trenutak da se posle bune protiv Dahija Turcima osvetimo na ovom prostoru. Kad smo došli u Potočare, meni je se učinilo da je sav svijet tu. Toliko je naroda bilo. Čini mi se, kada nigdje niko nije ostao, kada gdje god je ko bio, to je tu došlo. Pobjeg, otišli rotelj, djeca ostala. To je opšti haos. Dutch told interpreters to tell the people, which were thousands, still coming, that no one else can come in except babies, uh, mothers with babies. They just couldn't believe what they heard. The place fell, they don't let them in. They are stuck. The Serbs came and you could notice the, the fear with the Muslim uh, refugees for the Serbs. We were a shield, a living shield between the Serbs and the refugees. I heard there were two orders. One was to defend them, and the second was we don't allow you to bring body bags home. So, what do you have to do as a commander then? So you gave an order that your soldiers shoot my soldiers and that NATO Aviation Air Force uh, bomb my troops and my positions. No, not again. That's not decided by me. Uh, I'll ask the <coughs> uh, that something what they offer. They make decisions on what I put on information uh, from uh, the bottom uh, to, let's uh, say, even to the uh, United Nations in New York. Normally I do smoke. But I, I smoked so much uh, last year. Uh, I'm white. How do you see the result, the resolution of the situation here? Uh, 
If I may say something about that, and it's not the, uh, maybe not uh, the same as what they uh, will say in uh, Serbia, because they are the, the policy makers. The next time, is that in my, in my opinion, the uh, enclave uh, will be uh, ended. And that uh, for the sake of the, of the population. And not for the sake of the BIH. I should assist uh, the population as much as possible and uh, get out of uh, the enclave to, I don't know where they have to go. Noći su bile hladne. Moj muž je dao svoju jaknu jednoj ženi da zamota jedno dijete od godinu dana. Žena istričala, nije imala ni ušto da ga zamota. Ono cvili, plače, naveći ne može da spava. On je dao svoju jaknu, ona ga zamota, dijete zaspa. Cika, vriska, eto, nemam šta da vam kažem. Noćni krici su bili takvi da ja to nikad u životu nisam čula. To nikad nigdje nema. To nema ni u onim zamkovima kad se snimaju filmovi Strave i Užaza. Vas molim da zapišem. Pod broj 1 trebate da položite oružje i svima koji polože oružje garantija život. Da li ste me razumeli? Ne sebe i vašimi rukama sudbine vašeg naroda. Ne samo na ovom prostoru. Završio sam. Slobodni ste. Čekao sam deset sati sutra. Ispratite. Ali baš ja ne odgovaram na problema. To je vaš problem. Dobijete ljude koji mogu obezbediti predaj oružja i spasti vaš narod od ljudištenja. At nine o'clock, uh, somebody called my father as one of the most educated people there to go for a meeting with General Maric with other two persons. <laughs> Je trebalo bi se to 
Ja sam Ivan Mohamed. Ivan Mohamed. Umiran ekonomista. Bivši predatnik. Sad sam tu. Ja želim da vam pomogu. Ali tražim apsolutnu saradnju civilnog stanovništa jer je vaša vojska poražena. Nema potrebe da ginu vaš. Ni vaš muk, ni vaša braća, ni vaše komšte. Dovoljno je da kažete šta želite. I sinoj sam rekao, gospodin, možete opstati ili nestati. Za vaš opstanak tražim. Da svi vaši muškarci koji su pod oružja, makar i da su zločine pravili, a i jesu mnogi. Radi se pomoć na ređenju, da je paško s koma najmenje zanima, i trcet ćemo I saw Mladic and uh, he was uh, you know, walking uh, through the crowds and uh, giving uh, the refugees uh, bread and uh, cans of uh, Coca-Cola or something like that. And with all those cameras and, and stuff, I thought it was uh, more like a, a pro propaganda stunt. I saw between 30 and 40 buses coming down the road from town Bratunac and I saw hundreds and thousands in fact of people running towards these buses trying to board hoping that these buses would drive them away to some safe place. Da bi četnici uradili to što su radili, odvojili su sve muškarca od 12 godina pa do 77. Dobro, dobro. Hajde redom tamo za njim. Ne, ne, vi lijevo, lijevo. I saw the Bosnian Serbs taking the men out and telling them to go to a house and leave all, all the possessions uh, in, in the garden of the house. I, I told the Bosnian Serbs that I was an officer of, of the UN at that time and I wanted to see what was going on in the house. They were just gathering men over there. And they were very, very very scared of course and just by being there uh, we, we well, that that was all we could do we, we weren't in control at that time I could see uh, some Serbian soldiers they took a man with them uh, a Muslim man and they executed him uh, behind the house for as far as I could see they didn't know uh, any one of the UN people see, saw it. They took him behind the house, they put him with his face to the wall and shot him from behind through the head. I was at the gate looking if I could see some familiar face among the Serb soldiers because I knew many of them from the meetings and asked them for a favor to put my brother on one of these buses so I would not have, I would not have any worries anymore. But after about two hours I realized that I could not see any men and boys in the buses anymore. It was only women and children. 
when I close my eyes and I think back of the refugees, I don't see a man of my, my age. Nobody. Some women try to tell me that their men were gone and killed by the Serbs. At that time, I didn't know anything and I didn't believe them. So I tried to calm them down. I said, we are here, not, nothing will happen. Znate, kad jedno, za jedan čas, ljudi umiru, vještaju, vješaju se, oni odvode i kolju i rađaju se ljudi. Sve to u jednom se trenu dešava, na domak tebi možda od deset metara. I ti ne znaš šta se dešava. Znate, negdje se život gasi, negdje počinje. Ne, ne, ne znam da vam kažem, ne znam. a lot of soldiers um, every three or four meters there were two soldiers uh, facing uh, the woods the Bosnian Muslims uh, would come <laughs> they were just waiting for them and Bosnian, the Muslims couldn't go anyway uh, because uh, the entire road was uh, was locked by uh, by the Bosnian Serbs <laughs> Kroz opkuje nije šta, gdje su vam puške? Nisam nima puške, ja nisam, ja sam civil. Civil? Dobro. Nisam nima nije. Ste mnogo uprosili. Kako se nešto uplašiti? Ajde, bolo, ne bojiš. Šta se bojiš? Ajde, gore, ajde. Ajde, slobodno. Ne, 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 ne. I was crossing uh, a town called Nova Kasaba and there were a lot of people uh, gathering at the football field of Nova Kasaba. As they were gathering those men as prisoners of war. They were sitting on their knees with their hands in their neck and they were uh, just lined up, hundreds of men. Yes. Tek uspijevam da izađemo 13. jula iz Potočara. Tako da ja imam puno sreći, uspijevam da prođem sa djetetom, suprugom, čak je i majka moja bila u, u kampu i uspijevamo da uđemo u jedan autobus. Da smo mi tako nare došli, ispred nas odvojili dvojicu mojih komšija, odvojili su dosta i sad je došao red na nas. Mi smo išli kako smo mi naišli. Bio je sad jedan punkt. Na tome punktu su ovaj, stajali četnici naoružani. I kaže, sad kako mi idemo od ozgo, kaže ovaj jedan, ovaj, ti prođi ovamo, da moj muž prođe ovamo, a ti produži dalje. Da ja prođem dalje. 
I on meni kaže da se ja ništa ne bojim i da se ništa ne plašim, da će biti sve u redu. Je li toliko toplo bojao se da se ja ne one svijestim? A njegova ruka je stajala na mom ramenu, ona je drhtala, ona je negdje u dubini moje utrobe gdje drhti i sad vjerujte. Činim se svakog trena ja je osjetim ovdje na ovom mom lijevom ramenu. I taj njegov šapat, onaj vrući koji je ovaj dopiro do mog uheta i rekao mi je da se ja ništa ne skiram, da će sve biti u redu. Vidjela sam ga možda još deset metara dok sam ja zamakla iza onog transportera da s tim kamionom posle se odmah parkirao drugi ja ga nikad više nisam vidjela i nikad ništa ne znam za njega. Vjerujte da mi je sad žao da nisam rekla i nemojte ga ili možda da sam ciknula ili vrisnula ili zatražila neki spas. Čini mi se da bi mi bilo sad lakše živjeti. Samo sam odšla tako njemu, nisam mogla progovoriti. A suze su tekle ko rijek. I danas dan, ili vjerujte. People had to walk straight from the room to the gate. And at the gate there were at least 10-15 heavily armed, dangerously looking Serb soldiers. You know, very, very threatening, threatening look. W together with Dutch, they were all at, at, at the gate together. For independent television in Belgrade, what's going on today here? Do you know what's going on. I just came here. You know. Yeah. Jedan od tih vojnika je prišao meni i rekao djete ćeš dati suprugi, a ti ćeš poći sa nama. Bio je tu moment možda kada sam ja osjećao veliku tegobu, teškoću, kada sam se razdvajao od svog djeteta. Ali sam to morao da uradim, zato sam odmah dao djete suprugi i za moment sam Pokušao da se okrijedim još jednom da napravim jedan pogled prema djetetu jer razmišljao sam da će to možda biti zadnji pogled na svoje djete. Bio sam priveden pred jednu osnovnu školu. Broj ljudi u toku dana i u samo predvečer je bio je 22. Ja kada sam tu bio priveden mislio sam jednostavno, u stvari bio sam duboko ubijeđen da moj život je završen 
i život svih onih ljudi je završen. Poznajući sve ono što se desilo u Srebrenici, da je ta mržnja između ljudi, između te dvije nacije narasla beskonačno visoko, be, bila je ogromna ta mržnja. Tako da, da sam sigurno bio ubijeđen da je meni bila samo suđena smrt i svima onima ljudima. Around six, when the Dutch realized that I was keeping my family for too long in the office, they came with arms, not pointing their arms at my family, but with arms, you know, all looking at my family, all six of them, saying, you must leave right now. Hassan, tell your family to leave. No discussion. One ulaze u čionici i oni tade počinju sa tučnjavom. Oni su na svako svoje postavljeno pitanje zadavali udarce, bilo šutem nogom, bilo udarac puškom u glavu. Opsao mi matir balijsku, udario me onom šipkom iznad, iznad, desnu, iznad desnog oka. E, udarac je bio tako jak da sam na kratko izgubio svijest i da je da sam osjetio vrelu krv iz lice we were all worried about my brother of course we were all worried about my brother i mean i did not worry about my parents too much so they walked together towards the gate on the way we met major franken and franken says tell your father he can stay in the base because he's one of the negotiators with mladic and karamans my father says sir what about my wife and uh, son hoping that he would say let them stay too and he said listen tell your father if he doesn't want to stay he can leave too you know my father uh well uh, this 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 part of the story i cannot uh, really uh, tell you now in details because i don't even know how i could survive this moment at all looking at my family going to the gate Nothing can, can give me resolution. Nothing can uh, give me consolation. You see what I mean? I mean, I had to live with this all my life. And I will definitely uh, always at least uh, hate myself for one or another reason. I lay down on the bed and think what I could have done. Sometimes I tell myself, why didn't you grab the, the, the pistol from the, you know, Major Franken's holster, put it on his forearm and, and said, you have to keep my family in the base. For some reason, at those moments, you know, you are just like kind of, uh, you have no brain. You are so obedient that you just do what they tell you. Not only myself, all the people in the base. Nobody even complained when they walked towards the gate. Just, just walked, you know, just knowing that they were going to probably die. Meni je bilo jasno u stvari gdje idemo. Odvoze nas znači tamo negdje da nas pobiju. Vojnici sišli su sa naoružanjem. U tom momentu dok ja sjedim samo sam začuo ono kratak rafal. Vidio sam da su da je čovjek oboren i da je upućen Rafal prema njemu. Sljedeći čovjek je ponovo oboren. Ponovo sljedeći čovjek trojicu tako ljudi ubivaju. U ovom momentu uspio sam da istegnem vezu ruku od ruki. Znači na jednoj ruci je ostala žica koja a druga mi je ruka bila slobodna. Nalazim se znači na na klupi i u momentu dok su ovu dvojicu ljudi koji su skočili sa kamionom već pobili, 
Ja u tom momentu skačim sa kamiona. Nalazim se na neposrednoj daljini do šumi. Ugledao sam šumu. Kako sam skočio, samo je neko viknuo iznad kamiona. Pobježe matijer mu balisku. Kako sam ulećao u šumu, za moment sam pogodio u granje od šiblja i drveća. Posrnuo sam i tako sam pao u jedan dio gdje se nalazio mali potočić u toj šumu. Kada je potpuno paljba prestala, noć dalje je trajala, proveo sam u tom strahu, u tom drtanju, možda sat, dva, pa možda i tri sata. Znači, toliko dugo me držao taj jaki strah koji razara jednostavno, jednostavno organizam. Ali se desilo nešto lijepo. E, u svitanju ljetnog dana e, cvrku tica i pojava ranog svitanja to me ohrabrilo i unijelo neku hrabrost kod mene da je sad ipak dan da sad ja mogu drugačije i mogu razmisliti i mogu koristiti e, u šumi skrovište da bi se, da bi se mogao i sakriti We were in one empty enclave. We were still doing our job, uh, our daily practices. But it was all strange because the enclave was already empty. And we asked ourselves, what are we still doing here? We didn't know what to feel. We didn't know if we still had any feelings. On Friday, July 14th, the killing of the men of Srebrenica moved beyond the brutal episodes of the previous two days and became a highly organized massacre. A machinery of slaughter was set in motion, which over the next 72 hours would exterminate thousands of men. War crimes investigator Jean-René Ruez has built up a detailed account of the events which were to overwhelm the men of Srebrenica. The real chain of organized killing uh, in the course of that uh, Srebrenica operation will start in fact the 14th of July. Bratunac town became very quickly a um, concentration spot for all the prisoners captured. From there, the evacuation of all these prisoners is starting. From Bratunac, they are taking at a distance of about 50 to 70 kilometers up north and uh, scattered in uh, various concentration spots. The first convoys transported prisoners to a school called the School of Gerbavsi, where they were jammed into um, a gymnasium. That same day, another group of prisoners were um, transported to the school of Petkovci.
these executions have lasted during the afternoon and also part of the night. Uh, some of these executions were still not finished the next day and wounded were still finished off the day after. transportation of prisoners from Bratunatsk was still going on. And these people were taken to a school even more north uh, in an area we call uh, Pilitsha. They were then taken to the Banyevo farm for execution. They were executed on that farm from 10 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Once that execution was over, another group of prisoners, which was jammed uh, in a house of culture, was then uh, executed as well. In terms of people assassinated in cold blood and in these con in conditions, probably uh, above 4,000, around or above 4,000. <laughs> Have a safe journey. Thank you. 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 The feeling was that we were glad to be alive. That was the only feeling. They were just glad to be in Zagreb. You, you don't think about uh, what could have happened to you. Uh, you just think, well, we're out of there and we've made it together. It 
gave a, a feeling that I can't explain. After so many months, after these terrible days, just feeling safe again, knowing that we would go home very soon. On the other hand, the first stories came to us that here and there went killing going on. Today, the war is over. In the weekend market on the border between Muslim and Serb territories, just a few miles from Srebrenica, people who were bitter enemies meet to haggle and trade. But it's an uneasy peace watched over and enforced by more than 32,000 UN troops. thousand Americans who patrol the area including Srebrenica form part of the international force which maintains the peace in Bosnia. The horror of what happened here finally shocked the international community into action. In the early autumn of 1995 massive airstrikes and a Muslim Croat offensive reversed Serb gains. On November the 21st, 1995, agreement was reached at Dayton, Ohio for peace in Bosnia. The country was divided into ethnic regions and Srebrenica became part of Republika Srpska, an entirely Serbian town.
Today, Saliha Osmanovic lives in her brother's house near the Muslim town of Tuzla, 40 miles from Srebrenica. She lives alone, haunted by the memories of July 1995. Saliha Osmanovic has visitors. A team from Physicians for Human Rights have come to compile a detailed picture of her missing husband and son, Ramo and Nermin. They hope that once the details are entered into their computer database, along with thousands of others missing from Srebrenica, they may be able to identify Ramo and Nermin among the bodies so far exhumed. Reci mi, znaš li ti koliko je ramo visok? Je li više od tebi? Jesu. A znaš koliko si ti? Jo, kad sam se mjerila prije rata. Imaš ti šta protiv da ja tebe izmjerim, mamu? Pa ništa, pa jo, pa sve sam, ja boj, ja sam sve preživila. I ništa, ja nisam protivna, ništa, slobodno. Pa da zapališ? Ma ništa, sve tu, ja, ja sam sve preživila, sam da me neko zekolje. Ništa ja ne imam da ja nešto da sam potrešena. Ja sam potrešena, ne imam kudelji. Ma ja, što imam ja? Ja stvarno ne želimo da te uznemiravamo. Ne imaš ti što, mene uznemiravamo, čuj. Aj malo, ustanimo me. Nema problemo, evo ti sam. I kažeš. Sedefa Salkic is also a refugee from Srebrenica and she well understands the pain involved for Saliha in revisiting the details of her missing husband and son. Jel ponio sa sobom? Palač, tabakir, on uputio za duhan. Pa sigurno da jeste, ponio. Jel znaš ti da je ponio? Ja se ne mogu da sjetim. Šta što sam ja šestog jula sina ukopala, ako da mi pada na pamet nešto u tom trenim ucima. The visitors are careful not to imply that Ramo and Nermin may be dead rather than missing. Many of the women are unwilling to accept the final loss of their husbands and sons and the teams from Physicians for Human Rights know that success in identifying a body may mean the end of hope for the survivors. After thousands of interviews and years of work, Physicians for Human Rights are still struggling with the obstacles of fading memory to give names to the anonymous dead. To date, they have identified just 70 bodies. War crimes investigator Jean-René Ruez is following up reports of a mass grave. We are at the area where the main part of those who fled through the woods started to escape in that direction. For each site which was discovered in the course of this exhumation, every single of them started like this. First collect intelligence, then find the location, then dig a hole to check if there is a presence of multiple remains, multiple meaning mass grave, and then sparkle some exhumation process, which then is completed by experts. Today, the hours of digging produce no evidence beyond a piece of wire, which may have been used to bind the prisoner's wrists. But Jean-René Ruez is confident that there is a mass grave here. 
if we are unsuccessful with such methods, we'll bring in heavy equipment at a later stage. The level of proof has not to be different than a crime committed in Paris or in New York. The accusations are so heavy at the end of such an investigation that you cannot uh, play with the evidence. We have more and more flesh at the moment. It's going down in the grave. There are more and more, uh, more and more flesh on them. They're much easier to deal with when they're skeletons. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they, they become very difficult. And a huge amount of crushing effect. Crushing out of time because one body piled on top of the other. Mm -hmm. Uh, police people are more used to some situations, but the fact is that no one is prepared to be confronted to such a, a massive uh, scale uh, atrocity. Uh, it's, uh, it's part of the things that everyone thought were pictures in black and white. No one expected to see them uh, back in color and having to work on them. Since the first exhumations in 1996, Jean-René Ruez and his team have been amassing their evidence. Their task has been greatly complicated by the fact that the Serbs reburied many bodies in secondary graves to try and avoid detection. Now, investigations are focused on completing the evidence for the trial of one of General Mladic's most senior officers during the fall of Srebrenica, General Radislav Kerstic. Indictment. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia charges Radislav Kerstic with genocide crimes against humanity and violations of the laws or customs of war. General Kerstic was detained by S-4 troops in December 1998 and has been held in The Hague awaiting trial since then. He is the highest ranking officer to face trial for the Srebrenica massacre. General Mladic has been indicted but not yet arrested. Between 12 July 1995 and 15 July, Radislav Kirstic, BRS participated in numerous opportunistic killings of Radislav Kirstic, using automatic weapons and hand grenades, summarily executed approximately 500 summarily executed them, and used heavy equipment to bury the victims in mass graves and cover them with dirt. killed most of the members of the Bosnian Muslim population of the Srebrenica enclave. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? I plead not guilty. July 10th, 1999. Four years ago today, Srebrenica was on the verge of a nightmare. Tonight, a young man is getting ready to join the Bosnian Serb army. For him, as for every Serb, it's one of the most important moments of his life, a time for congratulation and celebration. The farewell party is being held in Bratunac, a few minutes from Srebrenica, in the hotel dining room where General Mladic delivered his ultimatums to the Dutch and the refugees. In the days marking the fourth anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre, this was just one of a series of events which laid bare the divisions still separating people here.
July 12, 1999, an important Serb holy day, is now an occasion for mourning the victims of the war. For Serbs here, it stirs bitter memories of Muslim raids on the villages around Srebrenica, led by Nasa Oric. July 13, 1999. At the former Dutch base in Potichari, Muslim women and surviving men join in a prayer for the dead. <laughs> In Srebrenica, on the anniversary of the massacre, they're celebrating the Serb Holy Day and the moment when General Mladic declared the liberation of Serbian Srebrenica. These days, Nasa Oric is a successful businessman in Tuzla and a fitness fanatic. He still longs to return to Srebrenica, but he's well aware that he continues to inspire hatred amongst the Serbs. Ako treba da ja odgovaram, ja ću odgovarat. Ali moram prvo izvagati vreme, prostor i situaciju u kojoj smo živjeli i ono što su Srbi uradili nama, što smo mi njima. Pa ako treba nasred da odgovara, budem ja sam tu, ja ne bježim od odgovaranja, ne bježim od suda, ne bježim od haga, nigdje. Samo trebate me pozvati, nikakav problem nije. At the tidy headquarters of the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, the work piles up with the bodies. Bosnia, Rwanda, Kosovo, the roll call of enormities seems never ending. A world reluctant to send its troops to intervene in genocide now looks to this place to offer justice. But most indicted war criminals remain free and the handful of those in custody take years to come to trial. For the desperate widows of Srebrenica, who are still waiting to bury their dead, justice seems painfully remote. Well, yes, I, I, they have every reason to be impatient, and, and I have a lot of respect for their uh, appetite for a much more expeditious answer. They need answers, they need closure, and, and I'm very respectful of that. Now, having said that, it takes a lot longer to tell the story of the perpetration of these offenses than to actually commit these offenses. Uh, we have, I think, an obligation, uh, as any criminal process, but maybe more so than a domestic criminal process, to get it right. Uh, to, to be as accurate, and, and this will have to stand the test of history. The minimum that it can create is uh, what one could call the principle of uncertainty, that these people, uh, know, knowing what they have done, knowing our existence, uh, don't sleep well during the night and uh, live in fear of uh, being captured one day and be held accountable for what they have done instead of uh, enjoying their lives and build a future based on the atrocities that they have committed. That's already uh, a beginning of an achievement. For four years now, together with the women of Srebrenica, Hasan Nuhanovic 
has been fighting to uncover the truth about what happened to his family. For all the survivors, the chasm between the slow processes of international justice and the overwhelming need for personal resolution has fueled an angry campaign. It's a very difficult fight because we are also under pressure that for the sake of the future of this country, we should not be so hard, you know, with, with this fight for the truth and justice. There are so many war criminals walking around, the bodies, the dead bodies are scattered just on the hills. You know, everybody's talking about reconciliation, returns. I, I don't know how it can go together with, with, with this with, that we are doing. I mean, I think it's not going to be possible to, to have future of this country without, uh, without uh, first uh, justice, you know, that, is, that should be satisfied. The women of Srebrenica have come to the tunnels where the bodies still pile up, unidentified. Just four years ago today, Ramo Osmanovic called his son Nermin down from the hills. <laughs> Salia Osmanovic cannot face the tunnel. For her, there is no answer here and no justice. Mm. Mm. And Leslie Woodhead returned to Srebrenica earlier this year to find out to what extent people have been able to rebuild their lives. Don't miss Never Again on Monday at 10 here on BBC Four. Tonight, stay with us for Animation Nation in a moment. <laughs>